the shortcut is audiences are selfish, right? Tell, tell me about me. <laughs> and, you know, when we speak, when we communicate, we think so much about ourselves. We say, what do I want to say? What, what points do I want to get across? But if you flip that and you say, what does the audience care about? And if you even go further and actually ask them in advance, what do you want to hear? What, would, what, what are you interested in? You can do so much of a better job hitting the mark, right? Who are the world's most interesting people? And what fascinating, groundbreaking, incredible things can they teach us? In this new series, I leave our Science of People lab to interrogate, I mean interview, my favorite authors, experts, and celebrities for them to share their best people hacks, social skills, and stories. And let me tell you, they have some juicy tips. This is a new series I'm calling The World's Most Interesting People. Hello, YouTube friends. I am so excited to have you here today. We're going to be talking technology, software, and behavioral science because today I am so happy to have Noah Zandon on the call. So Noah is the CEO and co-founder of Quantified Communications. You probably actually heard about them on this channel because we partner with them on a couple of experiments. This has become the leading firm in combining behavioral science, AI, and experiential learning to help people enhance their personal influence. My favorite topic. Noah's TED, TED Talks have over 13 million views use. He's a Bloomberg contributor and our Wall Street Journal expert on work communications. I've had the pleasure of partnering with him. Welcome, Noah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy to have you. So we have so much to talk about. I recently got to read your entire book, Insights to Influence. In I think I read it in four days. It was awesome. You feature all these really influential people and you dive into the meaning of influence. So I want to start off this interview by asking, what is the definition of influence? What is your definition of influence? So, you know, I wrote, I wrote a book about it, so I, I wish I had some, you know, perfectly succinct definition, but I think as you explore a topic, maybe you realize more and more what you don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for me, influence is the ability to, to decide what you care about and to help un other people understand why you care about it. And if they want to join you on that journey, to come with you on that journey. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the, the biggest learning from, from going out and talking to 21 global experts about influence was... Um, Influence is not a goal. It's actually an outcome. And you, I love that too, because one of the, the, the phrases you had in the book, which was the first time I was like, yes, I understand that was that your actions inspire others. So that could be moving them to action, moving them to thinking in a different way. And so I, I love that. And one of the things I think that I thought was really interesting is you looked at what sets the most influential speakers apart from others. And I'm fascinated by this topic. I love how you use, you take a software approach. So you break this down for me. You compared against the average speaker that the top 10% of influential leaders had certain things they did. Can you walk me through that experiment? I, our, our viewers love science. So how did that work? And then kind of what did you find? Yeah, so, so when we do an experiment, right, we start with what's the right question to ask. And so what we were trying to do was say, okay, influence is this big thing. But if I, if I break it down into a question, or maybe three questions in this instance, the questions were, uh, am I interested in hearing more from this person? Am I, uh, <clears throat> do I believe them, right? Do I want to follow them? And would I do something differently after hearing them talk, right? So interest, sort of influence, and then action, right? So breaking it down into those three areas, what we were able to do is to, to take a sample of people and then take a diverse set of audiences and say, when this person speaks, how do you feel? Are you interested in hearing more? Are you moved to do something, right? And, when, what, and so we, we do that, right? We collect those responses. Then what we go back and we do is we say, okay, for the people that score really high for moving someone to action or for I'm interested in hearing more, what behaviors do they do? Do they tell more stories? Do they use more facts? Do they quote other people? Mm -hmm. Do they do something with their voice or their face or their gestures, right? And so with the stats and data science, we can do, we can connect the dots and say, when someone does this, they get this outcome. And that's the intelligence that we want to bring to people to help them understand, to use your term, the science and the behavioral science behind it, and, and hopefully bring something new to light for, for people that want, that want that outcome in their lives. So what I love about this is you actually found some very concrete things. I don't know, I wanna dive into them. So I pulled out my favorite bullets from the book. And by the way, if you want to actually dive into what all these experts had to say, you have to read it. These are just like the highlights. The very first thing that I found fascinating was that the top 10% of influential leaders use three times more emotional words than logical ones. 
what do you mean by emotional words and how does this sound in practice? Like, is there a logical statement versus an emotional statement you can give us? You know, most of us, when we talk, right, we think about, I want to get the facts right. I want to get the content. right. But what our audience is looking at is how does this person make me feel? Mm -hmm. So you go hear a great speaker speak and you ask somebody an hour or two hours later, how was it? And you're going to get an emotional reaction from someone great, right? They made me feel good. They made me feel like they know me, right? Like you don't even necessarily remember what they said. And so the, the insight there, which is, you know, I mean, it goes all the way back to Aristotle, ethos, pathos, logos, right? Like is the more that we can tug on people's emotions and the more that you have something that you care about so deeply that you want to influence other people about it on an emotional level, right? Using sensory language using feelings language, using perceptory language. That's how you can bring that out of somebody, vivid imagery. And by doing that, then you can grab them on this level that they're actually, the recall is so much higher, the feelings are higher. You can even look at it from a neurological brain to brain connection level. Everything works better when you can tie into the emotional curve of influence. Okay. So the reason why I love this, so I had been, I've been following your work for years. And so I had seen your early research on this and it gave me an idea and I reached out to you and you were so gracious in partnering. I said, I was wondering if there was a difference between presidential inaugural addresses, us presidential inaugural addresses. And so I had this idea, let's take the oldest video I could find, which was uh, Harry S. Truman was the oldest video inaugural address I could find all the way up to Trump at the time. Cause uh, we hadn't had our, our 2020 election yet. And so uh, you were so kind, you put these, these speeches through your software. And before you tell me the answer, I wanna give everyone a quiz. So I'm gonna share some graphics that quantified communication made from this data, but I wanna do a little quiz. Okay, you ready? Here's the quiz. Which president used the most emotional language in his inaugural address? Your choices are A, Lyndon B. Johnson, B, Richard Nixon, and C, Donald Trump, C, Donald Trump, or D, George W. Bush. So which use the most emotional and which use the least? See if you can guess there. By the way, this was only Trump to Truman. The answer to this one was D, George W. Bush used the most emotion in the inaugural address while President Johnson used the least. So were you surprised about any of these inaugural addresses? Were you intrigued when you saw some of this data? Was there a surprising one for you? Well, a, a little secret between you and I, Vanessa, and everybody that's watching this is George W. Bush's chief media advisor is on our advisory board. So it's a, a wonderful communicator named Mark McKinnon. What he taught me in that in, when I was a low intern uh, and was lucky enough to, to work for him, he taught me two things. One, it's okay for someone to sleep under their desk after lunch. And he, took a, he took a power nap every day under his desk, which is an incredible thing that you know um, he, he showed me was okay. Number two, uh, the world is about storytelling. Right. And, and what he had figured out was how to craft a story. And, you know, we've done some writing about this. And Mark is an amazing you know, writer and storyteller. And I'm so happy to see his media success, because when you take some of the tactics of great stories and you bring those through with people, which is what he was doing with presidential candidates, you can really influence people and, and help people understand your message on a more powerful. And so I wasn't particularly surprised because I knew the brains and the power behind you know, George W. Bush was this incredible storyteller and incredible communication expert. I want to share some other facts from your book around this. So um, the, also the top 10% of influential leaders used 62% used more personalized language and 54% fewer jargon words. I think those kind of go together there. So what do you mean by personalized language? I, I think that George W. Bush was exceptionally good at that, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the shortcut is audiences are selfish, right? Tell, tell me about me. <laughs> and, you know, when we speak, when we communicate, we think so much about ourselves. We say, what do I want to say? What, what points do I want to get across? But if you flip that and you say, what does the audience care about? And if you even go further and actually ask them in advance, what do you want to hear? What, would, what, what are you interested in? You can do so much of a better job hitting the mark, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And so for that, like it's personalization and, and a big way you can get that across on a simple like tactic is pronoun usage, right? Don't talk about yourself, talk about them, mm. you know, or if you are talking about something that you really truly believe in, talk about yourself and use it in the first person and not the third person. And okay. the, yes. really being conscious, pronouns are choice language, right? Jamie Pennebaker is a fantastic researcher here in Austin. Uh, he runs the psychology department at the University of Texas, and he wrote a book called The Secret Life of Pronouns. An amazing book. Amazing book.
and one of the big things in the book is we have to say, you know, your name is Vanessa, my name is Noah, but the language I choose around that is choice. And that choice is a psychological cue to what's going on in my brain and a cue to the audience about what I care about. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is so juicy because this is something that you can use whether you're in a meeting, whether you're speaking in front of your team, whether you're giving a toast, these apply for every kind of, anytime someone's listening to you, these are the kind of words you should use. Okay, I have another quiz question for us from your research. And by the way, we're gonna put up some graphics um, that you created for us along with this. So I wanna talk about uh, negative language. So I found this really surprising. Which president used the most negative language in his inaugural address? Was it A, Donald Trump, B, John F. Kennedy, C, Barack Obama, D, George H.W. Bush? The answer is B, President John F. Kennedy used the most negative language inaugural address and President George H.W. Bush used the least. I was really surprised by that. Were you? I, most of us associate Donald Trump with negative language. So the right. general surprise is everyone assumes that, wow, this guy was really negative. Yes. Yes. Whenever I do this at talks, I do this at live talks and I have people raise their hands like 100% of the room raises their hands at A. And so it's a little bit of a twist surprise. Okay, one more for you, which is, which president used the most trustworthy language in his inaugural address? Was it A, Dwight D. Eisenhower, B, Jimmy Carter, C, Harry S. Truman, or D, Ronald Reagan? So by the way, will you define trustworthy language? I have your official definition here, but it's probably better if you explain it. So, so trustworthy language is the inverse to deceptive language, right? This is language that creates the dynamic of trust. So you believe that I believe what I'm saying is honest and accurate, and I'm not trying to be deceptive with you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the correct answer here is B, President Jimmy Carter used the most trustworthy language. And by the way, President Harry S. Truman used the least. The reason why I love this data is because I think it challenges some of our assumptions. And it also is a really uh, interesting way to go back and look, you can read these speeches or watch the videos of these speeches and see. And the last thing I wanna point out here is nonverbal. So we talked a lot about verbal so far, but a lot of your work also has to do with nonverbal, which you know is my favorite topic. You also found the top 10% of influential leaders use 47% better eye contact, 47% better eye contact. Does that, is that like universal? And it's like, is it when you're in front of a room making eye contact with everyone? Is it making eye contact directly with the camera? How do you define that? So eye contact is hard and it got especially complicated in this new virtual world that we're living in, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of classic research about how to make good eye contact, how to, you know, scan the audience and, you know, stop and make points and then evolve your eye contact and how to stare but not be creepy. There's <laughs> plenty of great research there about what to do in the room. The, the true challenge that we're faced with all the time now is, okay, what about a camera, right? I don't have a person to look at anymore. And I, I don't want to just stare at one dot because I, I get tired doing that. But like, how do I do that effectively when it comes to digital communication? What does good eye contact mean digitally is actually a really complicated question on top of what we talked about in that research, which was more traditional, like, what does this feel like to be in the room with this person? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so eye contact is a really important one. And I bring it up for two reasons. One is when you're in person, it really does matter. You actually have to make sure that you're making that eye contact, that you're making that personal connection. The second thing is virtually, it also matters. Research has shown that we can produce oxytocin, simplified, a chemical for connection, very simplified uh, over video cam, uh, even making this kind of eye contact with you. I wanted to ask one more question about the book, which is, which interview was the most surprising of all the, you had so many amazing people in the book. Which one were you like, just so surprised with the advice they gave? So there's a, there's a woman here, I'm based in Austin, there's a woman in Austin named Diana Kokoska, and she ran the, the coaching and leadership program at a large real estate firm called Keller Williams. She talked about the difference between sort of living your life as it comes at you versus living your life with intention. And I mean, she literally was very tactical about like an intention journal and saying, what do you intend to do every day? What do you want to achieve? And trying to align all of your actions and activities towards that goal and sort of consciously bringing that forward. So you don't live in a place of response, you live in a place of proactive intention and that being a key to influence in your life, right? Is a really remarkable tactic that I thought was, was, was really interesting. I just didn't expect it from that angle, if that makes sense. Noah, do you have any final words of wisdom for people who are watching who wanna to begin to take baby steps towards increasing their personal influence? You know, I, one of the biggest takeaways I have from the book is we all want to be more influential, right? Like that's generally everybody wants to be influential, but I think what a lot of us don't spend enough time thinking about 
is what do you want to be influential about, right? Do the deep dive to make sure that whatever you decide to make your craft, you authentically care about so deeply that you want to be influential about it for the right reasons and not just with the goal of influence. Mm. Well, I know that you are extremely passionate about your work. I know how much you believe in it. I know how much you can help people. I want to thank you so much for all the work you do. We have benefited from it at Science People. Our viewers have benefited from Science People. I hope we'll get to do more projects together. For everyone watching, I hope this kind of uh, triggers or sparks that there's some really easy things you can do to have a bigger, more positive impact on people. Now, I want to thank you for being on the channel today. Thank you. And thank you for the great work that you do. Oh gosh, my pleasure. If you like this video, give it a like and be sure to also tell us your favorite influence tactics in the comments below. Maybe I'll be inspired by you. Maybe you'll give me an idea for another video. I would love to hear your ideas. Thanks again for watching. Bye everyone. Don't forget to check out all of these goodies.